put it over you don't look bad. Well, <laughs> well, you look great. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. I don't unless, think people... men have huge, unless men have huge cauliflower warts on their head or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that tends to be true. So, but thanks for agreeing to um, do this talk, Mary. Uh, this will be the first um, conversation as part of the new magazine I'm launching called Taint, Taint, Taint. Um, why the magazine? I, I always wanted to do a magazine, but I always figured it would be too much work. And then, interesting enough, I had a friend who suggested that we do the magazine, so I agreed to do the magazine. And then at a certain point, I realized that she wasn't doing anything. She expected me to do all the work, but she was going to take credit for it. So uh, <laughs> in any so case, when you, so. How, when the, did you personally name the magazine? I did. Initially, the name was Taint, just one Taint. But um, I, I did some research and found out that, that there used to be a magazine named Taint that um, I believe was published out of the UK. So. Um, so I had, I decided, well, two taints don't quite work, but three taints, I think, have a interesting combination together. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is it in the traditional meaning of the term? Like, Yeah, I think it's in all of the meanings. Uh, you know, I, I have to say that um, the uh, many years ago, John Edgar Whiteman wrote a piece about Dennis Rodman for The New Yorker. And this is when everyone was sort of uh, trying to figure out what uh, Dennis Rotman was, who he was, and um, this is when he was just starting with the Bulls. And so in that um, article, John described Dennis Rotman as being taint in the in the sense of that physical part of, of the body. And that kind of always stuck with me. And so in fact, when I uh, decided to start the magazine, I uh, I asked John, I said, do you think I could use that piece maybe <laughs> in, the, in the first issue? But I have a feeling oh. that the New Yorker is not going to probably <laughs> let me. So, you know, but uh, yeah. But it turns out, of course, that Rodman was, is, he's certainly tanked, but he's all these other things that we didn't know about. I mean, he was, uh, he was actively uh, drinking, uh, you know, at the time he was playing with the Bulls and all kinds of things. So, yeah, he's, he's, he's ended up being kind of a tragic figure, I think. So, mm -hmm. in its own, own way. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I think the idea is to talk to you about, talk some about your work today. And uh, I think, you know, for me, um, for people who may not know you the way that I do, uh, I, I always think of you as, as having a, a singular mind. And I always, I'm always interested in your position on any topic. And um, for, uh, I guess I can say this, I also find that I could talk to you about any topic and that you never become offended or or um, or <laughs> or you never blush or anything like that. So, and you always have an interesting take on any particular topic that I bring up. So I thought that I thought one thing would be to to talk to you about your work, but also to 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 get more of your sense of the world and how you view things, because I think you always have a different way of seeing any particular subject. You know, so I'm a little bit of a taint myself, perhaps. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's the idea. And, you know, um, I guess the most immediate thing would be the question of the election. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the election and or um, Trump, where the country is heading, and how do you feel in the wake of the election? Yeah. Well, I, I think that, I mean, I, I can try to answer the question, but I don't, I think I'm very ignorant politically. Um, maybe not more so than the average person, but maybe less so than that. I, I really don't know where I stand that way. Uh, I don't know if my opinion is worth a whole lot. Um, I think it is. Yes. Well, anybody's might be, I guess, but yeah, I, I, I'm not, I view it with, I mean, I'm very relieved that it didn't win. Um, right. <laughs> although the fact that right. it got that many votes is whether it, even if it meant, even if we get rid of it for the time being or eliminate it from the White House, um, those people are still there. And I, I, I don't mean that I think I, we can't go off the record, can we? This, can this be edited? <laughs> well, I can, I can pause it if you want, and then we can <laughs> go back. Did you pause it? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think what you're saying is um, the, the 
it phenomenon uh, has awakened something in America that we know is here and, and it's not going to disappear simply because Biden becomes president. Yes, and it, I don't think he, I mean, he, he may have wakened it up and given it energy, but it's always been there. I guess the only always. plus is that I guess people like me didn't really know how many of them there were. Like, I remember when Trump was first running and I would look at his rallies, um, especially the ones that were overtly racist and having like having white supremacists there. I, I remember thinking this represents maybe 10, maybe 15% of the country. Um, yeah. Wow, was I wrong? Um, yeah. Not that I think all of them are like that. I, I actually don't think all of them are like that, but still it's a much higher percentage than I thought. So yeah, and the fact that also they just speak a completely different language, like right. I try to talk to Trump supporters when I can, just in a way out of curiosity, if I meet some of them. And some of them you can talk to on certain subjects, but others of them, it's like they're, they're in a completely different world that you can't, I, I can't talk to them. I mean, I can, but it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. And they probably feel the same about me. Yeah. Uh, so that's really a thing. And everybody knows that. I'm not saying anything new. But then also what I'm afraid of, what I'm really afraid of, one, I'm afraid that he's planning something really bad. I, I don't know if he can execute it, but if he has the, what, what really frightens me, and it was frightened me from day one as soon as he got elected, was that he has his, his supporters are armed. Yes, yes, yes. Some of them are in militias, which are some of those militias are, I'm sure, a bunch of stumble bums, but nonetheless, they, they know how to handle guns. And some of them have military training. There's that, you've probably heard of them, the Promise Oath Keepers. Right. Uh, right. They're yeah. ex military and cops. Uh, yeah. And then on top of that, if the army will obey it, um, I don't know if they will. Uh, yeah. I, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, my mind is going in kind of really scary directions, but it just doesn't seem impossible to me. Yeah. Well, you know, and then I just have one more thing I'm worried about. If you sure, sure. I'm worried about even even if it leaves, and Biden moves into the White House, and he, I actually have more confidence in Biden than I think you do. I think he's yeah. great, and I think he'll have intelligent people around him. I think he understands things like the coronavirus and the environment. I think he'll do his best to deal with that. But what I'm afraid of is that the problems are so bad on every yes. in every area that he's not going to be able to really, he and whoever is not going to be able to really make a big difference enough of a difference for enough people that by the time the next election comes people are going to say see we gave them a try and it's even worse they'll yeah. be even more desperate and that somebody else even worse than it will come along and then we're, we're screwed yeah well, that, that's what i'm really scared of yeah it's not so much <clears throat> for me it's not so much that i don't have confidence in biden I think, uh, you know, I, I had a strange position on the election, which is um, I, I actually voted for the Green Party, uh, but um, uh, I knew that uh, Biden was going to win the state. I live in here in Virginia, but um, in any case, uh, my feeling was that I want, I was hoping, not really hoping that Trump would win, but I felt like if Trump won, that it would at least show the country that uh, there's a real problem and that there would be a possibility of building some kind of progressive movement and my feeling now is that uh, with the Biden and Harris in office, that there would be the sort of usual kind of democratic complacency. I just don't think, um, you know, the, the progressive uh, movement represented by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren ha is not in office. I mean, there've been some, certainly some compromises, but um, I really think that's the direction the country needs to go in, which is um, to become a social democracy and to, you know, to, and to emerge into the 21st century rather than um, well, the way we, the way things are now, you know, which is a country that primarily caters to the rich and the powerful and where so many people struggle, you know? Well, I think you're more optimistic than I am in some way, because I think that if it had, if it remains in power, there, there will be, he will crush any progressive movement. I really think yeah. that he'll be unchanged. He would be unchanged. He would have been. Right. Uh, and people, if they demonstrated in the street, would start getting shot at. 
Right. Um, yeah, there was so. there was the real possibility of fascism, certainly of Trump had yeah. Whereas if Biden is there, I think a progressive movement can still exist. It will be allowed to exist and possibly even have influence. Like I think that yes. I think there was some talk about placing Elizabeth Warren in some key position. I, so I don't think Biden is completely opposed to a progressive influence. Yes, yes. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it will be interesting to see how it all plans out, uh, pans out. Uh, you know, of course, the it's not just racism and um, that sort of thing, but it's also uh, just the whole misogyny that Trump represents, which is, uh, I mean, even during the election against Hillary Clinton, like some of the things he said were kind of unbelievable or, uh, you know, that tape coming out or where he was about him grabbing women's vaginas and all that kind of thing. And it's amazing that this is the guy um, that so many people uh, voted for and that uh, that the misogyny was, was so apparent, you know. And he's he's shown that that misogyny is very much part of, our, of the country we, we live in, I guess the world we live in. Yeah, and, and I've got a kind of, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, like when people first started saying things about white men a lot, white men this, white men that, I felt kind of defensive about on the behalf of white men. Like I actually went toyed with the idea of getting a t-shirt that said, I heart white men and wearing it out in, in public. Okay. <laughs> Okay. see what happened. <laughs> and I bet people would have thought I was a Trump supporter. And I thought, well, maybe I could also put I heart black men and I heart yeah. Asian, whoever. And then they'd just think I was a sex maniac, probably. <laughs> but but, <Right>. um, <laughs> but I did feel kind of like, what well, lay off of white men. They're not all bad. But then I started kind of paying attention to some of the like things I was seeing on the internet, like the alt-right websites, which were all... Not, actually, they were. There's some Latino men, but Latino men can be white. You know, people right. always say Latino like it's a race. It's not. It, yeah. Lots of Latinos are white. No shit, they voted for Trump. They're white. Right. But but um, some of them. It's it's a big variety of people under that word. So I, I saw like some of the, the the real hardwired connection between, as you say, misogyny and racism that I was looking at on these sites of, yeah. of white men. I could kind of looked and I started thinking, holy shit, maybe they are bad. I don't, um, it, it was just, it, it's been kind of strange for me to observe that. But although this may be a, like an unpopular thing to say to you or to people who might listen to this, I, I sometimes have been able to understand, particularly the misogyny part. I, I think they're just sick of hearing about gender and rape and women complaining constantly and uh, I do. I part of me can't understand that, um, and they feel kind of like, well, whatever we do is wrong, and um, we can't we can't be masculine men anymore. I see. And, yeah. and I, I I I understand that, and I think I hope I'm not talking too much, but I like no. some black men apparently went voted. He got a slightly bigger sliver of black men supporting yeah. it, and. I don't know what they're thinking. Actually, I should not speak about that because I don't know. But it's just, I, I think, I think yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, I think I understand what you're saying. I, it makes me um, remember when Robert Bly had that whole Iron John thing. It must have been back in the late 80s, early 90s, where this uh, this sort of idea that uh, the men no longer had a space to be men in a kind of mythical way, uh, which I don't think equates to misogyny, but it was about, you know, it really was that mythical kind of sense of manhood that was represented in fairy tales, Iron John and, and that, if you know what I mean. That, that, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I think a lot of it is partly too that in the modern world, physical strength isn't as important as it used to be. It, yeah. it matters. It's still a thing, but it's, that used to be very important, and the thing that the things that men really do excel in uh, are less important than they used to be. And I think that's part of the maybe part of what has created a lot of discomfort for for men, whether they're white or anybody else. But um, anyway, yeah, back to your bigger point. I, I think that it has been a lot about not racism and misogyny, and also just a, I just think this is a brutal culture. Yeah. 
Well, in the, it, it seems like a good segue into your book, uh, This is Pleasure, or, or the certainly it was a story originally in the New Yorker, but uh, now in book form. Um, and it, it, there is a moment in the book where you use the word microaggression, which is um, a word that for me, I mostly associate with the uh, question of racism. You know, I've, I've heard it mostly in that context, but uh, in your book, it's uh, the character who uses it. She means this you know, this type of um, of misogyny or sexism. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk, talk any about that. Uh, well, microaggression, I mean, I think it can show up in all kinds of ways. So yeah, it's mostly used in a context of expressing racial animus in a subtle way. Yeah. Um, but I, it was a, one of these words that when I first heard it, I kind of rolled my eyes and was like, oh God, now we have, people have to worry about any little thing, but but it is it's true. There is such a thing as a kind of very subtle aggression that's can kind of drive you nuts because you don't. It's very hard to push back against it because it's so small. And I remember first hearing it in Syracuse when I was teaching there back in uh, I don't, back in I don't, 2006 or something seven maybe, and some black students were talking about ways in which they felt underserved by the Syracuse, uh, the university, and that one person, I don't remember how the, why this came up, but I, it, it, was a, it was a gathering that people were speaking. And a student talked about having experience of people being rude to her at, Ray, at Wegmans, this big prestige store, like a grocery store. Right. And I remember thinking, well, why, is she th why is she assuming they're being rude because she's black? They might just be rude people. And then years later, I was at a, a, a deli with um, these two kids that I've spoken with you. They're, they're not kids anymore, they're in their 20s, but these young, yeah, they're, they're Dominican kids, but they're very, they're dark and they're, and they're even apart from their physical appearance. They look, the average white person, they look mixed race, but they, yeah. they also yeah. really look ghetto. I don't know how to say it otherwise, right. Just anybody can read them that way. And I went, I was seeing them in Philadelphia and we went into this sort of fancy deli to pick up some stuff. And my God, I saw it. The people behind the counters were vibing yeah. them like they did not belong there. Yeah. I, I was shocked because these did not look to me like people who would act like that. But I, it was subtle, but it, it was unmistakable. And like even particularly the most egregious thing came from an African-American young woman who was working behind the cash register. The, the, my, uh, the girl um, went over, Maxiel went over to look at some cookies. They were like cookies in a jar, which you could reach in and get and put in a bag. If I had gone over to that cookie jar and done exactly the same thing, nobody would have, but this girl behind the counter was like, like, yeah. it was right. absurd. I, I was, I, I was like horrified. And I said, wow, the people in that store when we walked out, I said, the people in that store were really strange. Yeah. And the girl just looked at me and he goes, no, they weren't. Yeah. Meaning like normal. So I've, yeah. I've realized what that is. Yeah, I mean, I've had that experience all my life. You know, the I'll just tell the most recent example. Um, you know, here in Charlottesville, I went into a, a pharmacy to have some medicine filled. And uh, I thought things, you know, just normal experience. And long and short of it is like the the um the person selling the medicine you know the person behind the counter uh, thought she needed to explain to me how much the medicine costs rather than just simply fill the prescriptions and you know and the assumption is that because i was black i don't have money this is a a, a version of the, the microaggression thing i'm black i don't have money and uh so, in it, so rather than waiting 30 minutes to have my prescription filled, I have, you know, she told me to come back to 30 minutes later and uh, various other things happened in this racist town. And uh, by the time I came back, I was angry, you, you know, a couple hours later. And when the cashier asked me uh, what my name was, I told her my name is Black Lives Matter. You know, <laughs> she said, what's your name? I said, Black Lives Matter, you know, and, and uh, making a point of it. But um. But I've had the similar experiences in New York as well. You know, like uh, you walk, I, I walk into a store on, I lived in New York for 23 years and you go into a store on Fifth Avenue or whatever. And, you know, the attendant there, whether it's a black person or white person, they see me 
they don't bother to come over to ask me if they can help me because they just assume I don't have money to, you know, these, these kinds of, not to mention the uh, experience where you go in the store and the person you're followed around and yeah, all of that. So that's part of it, I guess. Yeah. yeah I mean, years ago, I, I would, I wouldn't have assumed that the people, that black people were, were, making that up, but I would have thought maybe they were being paranoid or something, but not after seeing that, I don't. Yeah. This is. But you know, it, it was interesting that, um, I don't know why I just thought of this, but uh, there was um, one of Dave Chappelle's skits where he sort of makes this connection. Uh, well, he sort of brings this, this uh, brings home what, what it's like to be a woman. And he, <laughs> the joke was that he was talking about how, um, when he was young and living in New York and he would perform for drug dealers and they would give him 20 or $30,000 and he would put the money in, in a backpack and then he would go to where he was living in the Bronx or somewhere in Brooklyn. And he was saying like, if, uh, you know, if they had given me a vagina, I wouldn't have accepted it, you know, because I would, <laughs> I would have been harassed the whole time. So, you know, he, and he was talking specifically about what uh, I think about the experiences of his daughter and how having a, a you know a daughter who is now of of age where men desire her of how that's really brought the meaning of sexism to him, you know. If that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah, I think I think that um, I don't know if this is still true, but I think that white feminists anyway used to kind of equate racism and sexism or kind of see them in this, as the same similar types of. Uh, uh, bias and I, I don't I personally don't I think they're very different yeah uh, categories of thing yeah uh, the woman's gender can really can you know you sh you're subject to certain bad things and discrimination but you can use your gender very much to your favor in your favor too and you can uh well, I think in some ways he was saying it was worse to be a woman it, it, well you know being black and was one was one issue or living in the ghetto was one issue but if he had been a woman too that would have been even worse you know i think i think that was kind of the point he was making so well except i i have i I've, I've heard and read um that in some ways black black women have done better than black men in terms of their ability yeah. to make money and move into a more mainstream society do you have any opinion about that I would say that's by for the most part true. I would say um, certainly um, I find that um, a lot of the women I know who are professionals. Uh, well, let's put it like this. I think I I know far more women who are professionals and who've had success, and I know men. Um, what for whatever that's worth. That's just my own circle of people, you know. But, Why do you think that would be the case? Uh, I think part of it is because, um, you know, I think even like this, you know, I'm 58 years old and just my own experiences growing up in Chicago, uh, you know, education was kind of a corny thing. Like if you, uh, you know, if, if I had a book, uh, I used to carry my paperback books in my back pocket and put my shirt over them because you were seen as square and corny. Whereas women were, didn't have that pressure. They were expected to succeed and they were in some ways they were expected to be smarter than men you know uh, because they were they could concentrate on their books whereas whereas uh, we were supposed to be tough and and these other kinds of things you know that makes any sense and i think there's still that pressure in the, in the culture yeah often. that makes sense yeah Do you also it's occurred to me too it could be because and this is again one uh, an advantage of being a woman is that people sometimes sometimes it's not but it, it can be people are less in general are less threatened by women yeah whether it's a right or vulnerable woman so you know a woman walks into the room and people are more likely to be on some level a little bit receptive or if it's a man yeah um perhaps especially if it's a black man um people are going to be a little more wary whereas so the woman has a little more leeway simply because of that that's occurred to me as possible yeah you know, I have a son who will be 20 years old next month. And I think uh, these are some, some of the things he's negotiating as a black man. Uh, how can, okay, go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> he, uh, that these are some of the things he's negotiating as a black man that he has, um, on the one hand, he has to be intelligent, but he also has to be cool. 
Um, you know, he has to be business savvy and a hustler. You know, he wants to, to uh, make a career in the entertainment industry. So these are all sort of the things he's navigating. Uh, and I never know if I should send him another book about, you know, some particular subject that interests me, but may not interest him. Or, um, so yeah, I think, I think these are still some of the issues. And then he has to also deal with this question of being seen as threatening as well, because he is, he's not as large as I am. I'm six two, but he's six feet. And, um, he still will be perceived as a threat because he is a large uh, black man as well. So, yeah, I did have a, a question for you. I, I wonder, um, um, uh, actually, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Do you consider yourself a feminist? Is that a, a term you would use to, to describe yourself? Um, I guess, I mean, it's not, it would be kind of far down on the list of things that I am, but uh, in the sense that I believe in it as a valid social force, yeah. Um, I don't like some things about modern feminism. Um, I mean, I mean, really contemporary feminism, um, but still I, I would say, yeah, I, I support uh, in general a feminist worldview. Um, but what is it? In, what are some of the things that bother you about modern feminism? I'm curious to know. Or contemporary, I guess, is the better word. But contemporary. Uh, I really have a problem with the idea of gender as a social construct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, like, for example, race, I do think, is largely a social construct. I would even say it's pretty much entirely that because its racial differences seem they're superficial. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, I've never seen any evidence that they're anything but that. Well, certainly but, the, the biological, the, the DNA test would seem to suggest that. Yes. Yeah, they're, the, the, however differently different races look, they fun the body functions exactly the same way. Yes. The brain functions, I mean, it's the same thing. But um, gender differences are pretty profound and they're physical. And I don't see how, I, some of it's social, certainly. I mean, I don't know how you'd break it down because I do think some gender ideas are plainly social and reinforced by, so, by social norms in a way that's sometimes really painful for some people, maybe even a lot of people. But, but the fact is it's a, it's a physical, functional difference that's pretty profound. Even there's some brain functions that are different. I don't mean better or worse. I right. just mean different. Yeah, just um, because there is a gen there is a difference in gender doesn't in, in and of itself imply some kind of sexist bias. I think that's maybe the assumption that's going on with the mo modern contemporary feminism. That if we if we yeah. uh, if we identify this difference, then we're naturally also accepting some kind of bias on the against women. I asked a, a woman who's my age, more or less, why she believed that because I felt I could talk to her and she said that she said that because if you say there's a difference right away you're going to be getting into which is better and which is not and I, I don't think that's necessarily true and it almost I didn't say this to her I didn't want to get in her face totally but she I felt like well if, are you worried that there's a difference and that you're inferior is that are you actually fearful of that and that's why you want to maintain this idea that there's no difference because that's what it sounds like to me um yeah, yeah. But see, that's I I do have a problem with that, and I think it it, it leads to kind of almost uh, a fantasy that, that 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 there's complete parity in every area, and I I think that's even a little dangerous. Yeah. Um. Yes, I heard what you said. I was going to off school, you know, uh, ask you. You were born in Kentucky. Uh, I don't think people would see you as a Southern writer. Is, is that a label you would uh, accept? I certainly wouldn't mind if people, but I don't, I don't think it would, I don't think anybody would call me that because I mean, one, Kentucky is a border state and two, really actually no, one, I, I didn't really grow up there. Okay. So the influence it would have had would be minimal, except both my parents were born there and I was always aware of it as a background, but uh, I don't think it had that much influence on me. You don't think, yeah. uh, would you say that you're, well, you know, for me, I always think of, um, of uh, the Southern writers having a particular relationship to language, a richness of language. Did your parents have that at all of them and bringing that at all to you? They were very verbal, certainly. I mean, they were both really, uh, 
uh, you know, talkers, um, and not that they talked a lot, but they could speak well. Uh, naturally, it wasn't something that they learned. And in, in, I mean, my mother had a year and a half of college. My father did have college, but, um, and they also could be very slangy in their speech if they wanted to. Okay. So, yeah. Well, you do have that richness of metaphor and and uh, just linguistic range in your in your work. So that's something that that makes that I if I had to label you as a Southern writer, I would say that's one aspect of your work that I that would make me think of you that way. So. Okay. And I'm just I'm just throwing it out there. I I, I just. You know, I'm not saying that you are, I hate labels anyway. It's just a curious, interesting question to me. <laughs> so. Well, it's not a label I would reject. But, yeah. Um. yeah, you know, the, the, I was also thinking the other day about the, the first time I, I ever saw you. Um, and as memory serves me, it was in the spring of 2002. And I went with a friend to the 92nd Street Y for some event that I believe was, he was either honoring the American short story or it might've been an event for best American short stories, but you were on the stage. Um, I should preface this by saying that uh, at Brett Loaf in, that, that would have been in early, well, actually in late 2001 at the Brett Loaf Writers Conference, we, there was some conversation about you there uh, among us young writers. I was uh, I was one of the fellows at the time, and uh, I, I'll just say this is how you were described to me. I knew I knew your name, but I I hadn't read your work, and we were kind of having conversations about who was worth reading, and someone said someone said, um, "Oh yeah, Mary Gayscale. She's like nobody else. You have to read her." And hey, did you know that she used to be a prostitute? That, that was that was kind of how you <laughs> you were introduced. I said, "Well, well, that's kind of interesting." So, you know, uh, and I, I do think like that whole characterization, and now we, we will say sex worker or whatever, but like uh, that somehow became, uh, that somehow got associated with you and your writing. And I, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts about that whole thing. Well, I hate to say this, but it's true. <laughs> right. I knew you were gonna ask about that. Right, I knew. I, I knew don't know how. I did. <laughs> it just came into my head this morning. He's going to ask about that. What am I going to say? Um, yeah, people, I mean, you're definitely not the first person to say that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I remember um, once I, I was giving a reading a long time ago, at probably the late 90s, I was giving a reading at some university. I don't remember what it was. And um, somebody's uh, mother was there at, at the dinner before the reading and she was like, well, I've certainly read some things about you. I heard, <laughs> I, I heard that you used to be a call girl. And I was like, oh, kind of. And um, then after the reading, she came up to me and said, that was really great. I'm really impressed. I said to my daughter, whatever that little girl used to be, she's all writer now. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So. It was. So I guess, um, I, I don't know what to say. It's, it's true I did that for a little bit to support myself sometimes when I was much younger and I had no money. Um, uh, I certainly didn't do it for research. Um, and I don't know how important it is to my writing now or to anything, but uh, well, I would say that um, to me, you always write, well, you know, you, you, you write very well about sex and sexuality, which is not an easy thing to do. And that's, I think that's true in all of your, your work, uh, as far as I can remember, um, at least in most of your work, certainly in all the novels and, uh, and in many of the essays. I was thinking, for example, uh, your essay about Linda Lovelace, just like, um, it just, it just, your, your reading of her life is one that uh, is pretty singular. And um, I don't know, I just, I just think that you write very well about sex and sexuality. So not to, not to say that has anything to do with, the, with your having, have, having been a call girl or anything like that, but, but it is an, it's a great aspect of your, one of the things that characterizes your work, I think. So. 
So in other words, of- I guess what I'm saying is someone could, she could, my friend could have said to me, wow, you know, she writes really great about sex instead of saying, oh, you know, uh, she used to be a call girl or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I, I think it's a funny thing that it, people, that stands out to people. So how old is your friend? Is she uh, you? Yeah, she's in her, she would be in her mid fifties now. Yes. Well, I think that it's interesting. I, I asked because I, I think part of the reason that I felt free to say that. I mean, I think it's, you would be, a lot of women that I knew uh, when I was coming up would do things like that. Maybe not, they might work in a piano bar where they're basically paid to talk to men and maybe go out with men. I don't know if you heard of that. It was a thing in New yeah. York and then it's a Japanese style piano bar. Okay. Um, I knew a lot of women who did that um, and or some other type of work like stripping or whatever. Um, phone sex is another big one. A lot of women would do that if, again, if they really needed money. And so it, it also had to do with the period of time that, that like I come from, we've come from a generation of people when people were really uh, open to exploring all kinds of things having to do with the sexual world. I, I didn't, you know, get into that business because I was exploring anything, but it's just, it was less, it stood to me as less forbidden than it might have been to a woman like me in the 1940s, yeah, um, 50s. Um, and so it's interesting that, uh, that your friend, even though she comes from the same generation, but maybe it stood out to her for that reason. It was like, oh, here's somebody who's actually part of that. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, what do you think about the word sex worker? And, you know, because um, for me, I think there's a different. There certainly is a difference between sex worker and prostitute. Of course, prostitute is considered a, de- a derogatory word, but like, um, you know, there's a. I think there's a difference between a, a between a per, between a woman who chooses uh, to uh, to sell her body because she needs money. Uh, just for some basic survival skills, as opposed to a woman who's, let's say, forced into it by a pimp or, or someone who's so desperately poor that they can't eat otherwise. You know, if, you know what I mean. There's a there's a range of experience there, and I don't think the words for me the word sex worker doesn't encompass that entire range, but it makes it seem like this honorable profession, if, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, I don't have any feeling about that term. It seems like kind of a silly term, though, because people are always trying to come up with terms. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should change the subject. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. I'll be... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Is he out of the room now? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> really, I don't know. I don't think you should hear this. Um, He's little, but kids can understand things really That's remarkably. True. He got really out of the room. He is, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it just seems like one of those terms people invent when they're trying to come up with a nicer term or a more dignified term. Yeah. And I don't think that, I, I mean, for me personally, the word it's, uh, itself, prostitute, is not derogatory. It's, it's, it's Sometimes it's just a descriptor of somebody, what they do. If yeah. somebody to actually a prostitute or something else and you call them a prostitute, then yeah, that's, that could be insulting. I mean, if I'm called a prostitute in relation to my writing, I would not like that. Right. I would also think it was grotesquely uh, inaccurate. I'm not prostituting myself one minute at all with my writing. I, I don't write about things. I might write about things only for money, but not something that I perceive as just really wrong. I've actually turned down well-paid jobs that I thought were really yeah. uh, doing something wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, what else would I was going to ask you? Um, I was going to say, uh, I, I, I mentioned how I first, first time I saw you, then I first time I met you was actually in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2004, when we were both teaching uh, for the summer literary seminars there. And, um, and I've, uh, you know, I, I would say you've been a friend since and uh, you know, I, the, the the thing that uh, stood out about that trip is the time that you hit your your head against the bottom, <laughs> the bottom of a bridge in St. Petersburg. And you actually have written about that. And um, 
But you know that for me that's an interesting image because it, you were so absorbed into um, you were so occupied in trying to absorb the world around you that you were standing up in the boat. I didn't actually see it when it happened, but my wife at the time actually saw 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 the incident. I only saw the aftermath. But you know it shows it's a good metaphor for you as um, as a writer who. Um, as a writer who really observes the world and takes risk, uh, even at the, you know, the um, the danger of, of self harm in some ways, if that makes any sense. Well, I didn't actually stand up. I, I we were the 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 bridge was so low. Were you on right. the boat? I was on the boat. Yeah, I was at the front of the boat, and I think you were at the back of the boat, if I remember correctly, or maybe the front the of the boat. Then. Yeah. The tide was up, so the bridges were so low that we had to duck our heads all the right. way into our laps. That's right, we had so, to duck. Yeah, I remember that and now. It was, I wasn't so, I didn't actually stand, but I raised my head a little too far because I was, there was uh, some people on the, I think there was a guy walking on his hands on the bridge. Oh, okay. And a woman, oh, wow. a woman was watching him, was walking by and looking at him and her skirt was moving in a particularly, I thought, beautiful way. And so, yeah, I, I looked, I raised my head a little too much um, to, okay. to look at that. And that's how I got hit in the head. An interesting thing is that you uh, continued uh, at the conference and you taught your workshop uh, for those two weeks or so that we were there. I thought that said a lot. <laughs> I mean, I think most people would have been ready to go home. Yeah. I don't know why they <laughs> they decided to make this into a game now. <laughs> referring to my two. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, right. Staring at the boring person on the screen. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but you know, you um, you continued uh, and taught your classes. I, that was a question I actually had about um, what. How do you feel about teaching and? One of the things I think I know about you, if I'm, if I'm correct in saying this, is that when you teach, um, you you don't write. Am I am I correct in saying that? Well, I try to write. I, I'm not able to write. I'm not able to focus on my writing. I, I unfortunately um, don't have a very strong ability to do two absorbing things at the same time. Okay. Um, like I I don't like to be involved in something else that's very, you know requires a lot of my attention when I'm, when I'm writing. So it's hard for me to write while I'm teaching. Although if I'm only teaching one class, I can do better. Um, I've, I've tried to get better at it over the years. Is it, maybe you're remembering in the past, I used to not write at all when I taught. I just couldn't do it. Yes. And I've, got be I've gotten better at it now, especially if it's only one class. Okay. All right. And uh, I guess another question I have is what it, what is it like to be married to a writer? I mean, uh, does it um, does it feed the work? Does it? I mean, I don't know if that I'm, maybe that's an awkward question. I don't mean it to be an awkward one, but I mean, I guess I'm trying to ask like, how does the? Um, I've never been married to a writer or even really seriously involved with the writer. I, I think so. I'm curious to know how that affects your work, if, if at all. Um, well, it, it does actually. Um, he's, I would say mostly he's very helpful. He's a very good reader. Um, he can make, he sometimes makes very inspiring comments or suggestions. Um, that was more true. There was a period of time where I really leaned on him quite heavily for that. Not so much anymore, uh, mostly because he's working very hard at teaching and writing. Um, but, um, I mean, there's a downside too. there, there can be kind of writers are, <laughs> writers are very, uh, introspective, anxious people pick over things a lot. And so that kind of gets compounded when you're, when you're right. I understand. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, that's, we're talking about Peter Trachtenberg, but so for those of who, those in the audience may not know that the two of you are married. Uh, a very uh, accomplished, um, brilliant uh, nonfiction writer. Um, 
And the, do you play the same role in terms of his work as, as are you his first reader and, and such? Well, I try. He doesn't listen to my advice that much. But okay. <laughs> he usually goes, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that just didn't happen. But, um, but yeah, sometimes. Okay. Every now and then he listens to me. Yeah. I wanted to just close with a few questions about your book, The Mirror, your, your uh, most recent novel. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I'll phrase the question a little, a little differently. Uh, we were having a, I wouldn't call it a debate necessarily, but we were having a discussion about this idea of autofiction. And um, you characterize yourself as a writer of autofiction. And I never really thought about your work in those terms because uh, all of fiction to me means a, a very kind of a, a particular kind of thing with the first person narrator, uh, you know, the Sebaldian or Zebaldian type of narrator who uh, who walks about the world and observes things, kind of the, the flaneur who observes and makes connections. Whereas your books are uh, certainly based in plot and story and ways that uh, someone like Sebal would be. Come on guys, you have to, let me finish here. I'm sorry. No, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Um, I actually don't characterize myself as a writer of autofiction generally. Oh, okay. All right. I had I got that wrong then. So. Um, although I I could see why somebody might think that because I I have based some. Hello, cutie. Hey, hello. Yay! Then hello. I have to finish. I'm interviewing her. I can't hear This is going on YouTube later, okay? So he told me if I uh, post this on YouTube, I'll James. become a millionaire. You have to be so, No, you don't have a diamond play button. <laughs> I have a diamond play button, okay. What is it? Okay, guys, let me finish and then I'll see you in a minute. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, some of the things I've written have been based on my life, but I feel free to depart from my life quite a bit. Like the mayor was based on, based on an experience I had, but it was very different. I mean, I think people can be forgiven to think that the character Ginger is really tightly based on me, but it, she's not. I'm very, I mean, she shares some things in common with me, but I'm very different from that character. And the character of the girl, Velvet, is very different from the actual young lady that came to my house and stayed with me every summer. Was she kind of a, um, let's say maybe a fantasy version of her, an idealized version yeah. of, the of the girl that is? She's different. Just different, um, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the real person in some ways is probably quite a bit more interesting. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, I, I characters and real people are. It's hard to be as interesting as a real person. Yeah. How do you get How do you get that on the page? Is the question, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah any real person is a lot bigger than any character to be. There's some great characters in the world. Yes. But it's hard to get the entirety of a person. Well, do you think that? Do you think that? Um, modern writers today still have, or contemporary writers today still have that, um, I guess it was Ian Forrester talked about how the Russians often had characters that have the greatest range on the page. Do you think it's, that's a possibility still that exists for contemporary writers of fiction? It's certainly a possibility. I, I don't know if they want to do it. It seems like people's range is getting smaller and not bigger. Yeah. Um, because not because they can't, but because they, this is kind of a big subject, but it seems like people have gotten more, much more attuned to representing people like kind of by shorthand indicators rather than a lot of depth or range of who the person might be and what they might think about and see. Yes. And why do you think that is? Why why has there been this narrowing? Do you think? I, I'm not sure, but I, I this is a very common opinion, but I think it's true that I think that people have become very used to expressing themselves on Twitter and on social media, and that relies very heavily on really 
socially agreed upon memes and shorthand for who people are. And there's nothing wrong with that in, in its in its place, but uh, it's a very small way to look at people. And I think it's also because people are afraid politically. I think people are really scared. And when people get scared, they want to make things as simple and as easily agreed upon as possible. Yes. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, that makes sense, yes. Well, can I end with a final question, which is, uh, what are you working on now? Well, it's probably a doomed uh, project. I'm trying to write, write a play. Oh, OK. Um, wow. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So it, I, it's. Was this, is this been commissioned, or you just decided to, to do? I just decided to do it. It's I'm not going completely into the outer space. I'm it's I'm trying to make a play out of that short uh that little novella, This is Pleasure. Oh, okay. Wow. That would be a great play. I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> I I think so because it's to me there's a lot of humor that didn't really get into the book itself and a lot of things you could show about the cultural background that the person is coming from and how it changes. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that, but I thought being in a play, it's a much more broad and visual medium. Yeah. And you can play with like that. Remember that vision, that, that version of your, somebody sneaking up behind you. Be careful. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that like the gall story the nose. Right. That. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Well, also, there's a scene uh, where he puts his nose and he puts his is it he puts his finger in front of a woman's nose and he tells her to bite his finger or something, <laughs> which is actually yeah. kind of funny scene. I mean, it's as offensive as it is, you know, in its own way. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. It may fail completely because, like I said, I don't really know what I'm doing. But yeah, it sounds like a great thing. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for taking the time, and um, I really appreciate it. So, you too. Thank you. I think All it's right. a great idea. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Let me stop, right. All right. Okay. stop this. What happened to the? Uh,